I want to talk to you this evening about what God is like. Luke chapter 15, beginning at verse number 11, Jesus tells a parable that reveals to us the nature of the Father. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all of his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. Verse 20. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. He saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet, and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast, for this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. Holy Spirit, I pray that as the word goes forth, you would convict the heart of the lost. You would call the sinner to repentance as only you can. And we pray that Jesus would be magnified. We ask that in faith, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Like that son, all of us at one point or another have wandered off. Now notice in the parable that Jesus says that the son went off to a distant land. These words paint for us a picture of a great gap that exists between creation and its creator. Because of sin, because of that rebellion, because of that stubborn heart, the son found himself distanced from the father. And this is what sin does. Sin puts you in a distant land. Perhaps you're living your life wondering if there might be more. Wondering about your purpose. Wondering as to why you exist here upon the earth. And the scripture makes it clear that man has rebelled against God. And many are living in the shame of sin. They're living in the prison of selfishness and unrighteousness. They're living in the prison of rebellion against God. Like that son, we too have gone to this distant land. We too live under the shame of that sin. Think of how the son desired the food of the pigs because he was so hungry. That emptiness really causes you to search. That emptiness will have you taking in pleasures without purpose, action with no holiness. That emptiness that you sense will have you searching the world over for something to fill that void. You may try to find it in relationships, and come up empty. You may pursue it in wealth, the acquisition of material things, 
and come up empty. And you may find that as you walk through this life, you sense that you are not quite connected to what you should be. You sense that something is very wrong. And in fact, if you look around our world today, at the chaos, at the violence, it's quite obvious that there is a great evil in this world. That great evil is the rebellion of man. That great evil is the sin of mankind. The message that Jesus speaks through the scripture, the gospel that I'm presenting here this evening is not that God will fill the void in your life. Though he does bless his children, though he is there for his children, though he works miracles, that's not the gospel message. The gospel message is that we are sinners separated from God by our rebellion. And God in his goodness and in his mercy pursued us, sending his son to die on the cross, absorbing the wrath of the heavenly father, absorbing the punishment of that sin so that you and I might go free. But if we don't know this, if we push this out of our minds and hearts and we find ourselves too, as the sun eating with the pigs, wallowing in the misery and the shame and the muck and the mire of rebellion against God. Distant. Isaiah 59 verse two says, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Now, the good news is that God, in response to this rebellion, didn't give us the punishment that we deserved. He didn't just throw his hands in the air and finish off mankind for good. Like a father, like the father in the story that Jesus told, like the father who ran after the son seeing him in the distance, like the father who threw his arms around that son our heavenly father too came running after us. Come now, he says, and let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. He's reaching out to you this evening and he's calling you out of your rebellion. He's calling you to turn from your sin before it's too late. In his mercy, in his compassion, in his love, God the Father is pursuing you. And many are hardening their hearts, pushing away from their minds, pushing away from their conscience, the awareness of God. But he made a way for us. Colossians chapter one, verses 15 and onward say this, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything for God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ and through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who were once far away from God. The Bible here describes us before Christ as enemies of God. You were his enemies separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself to the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. He's closer to you than you realize. 
what Jesus did on the cross through the shedding of his blood, through the giving of his life, was a sacrifice made for you. When he died on that cross, Jesus took your punishment. When he died on that cross, Jesus took your shame. When he died on that cross, Jesus made a path to reconciliation with God. For Jesus has said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. It's through Jesus that we find our way back to the Father God. It's through Jesus that we are reconnected with him. It's through Jesus that we are set free from sin. God loves you. That, that, is, that is the greatest truth I can tell you here tonight. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. He's not far from any one of you. He's, he's closer than you think. And here as the Holy Spirit draws you to Jesus, I believe that the Father God is looking at you. And I believe he's looking at you with eyes of compassion and love. Does he punish sin? Absolutely. Does he judge wrongdoing? Absolutely. But as of right now, God is offering a path back to him. He sent his son that you might not perish, but that you might be reconnected with the heavenly father. God did not create you to live with addiction. God did not create you to live in depression. God did not create you to live with fear and anxiety. God did not create you to live in unrighteousness. God did not create you to be bound by darkness. God did not create you to wander without purpose. God did not create you wondering if you're loved. God did not create you to live without joy, to live without peace. God created you to love him and be loved by him. And because of his love for you, he sent his son Jesus to bring you back home. And this is despite our wrongdoing, for Romans 10, 9 declares, and that message is the very message about faith that we preach. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. And it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. As the scriptures tell us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. You call on him and he will answer. You call upon the name of Jesus and he will respond. Despite what you've done, no matter your past, no matter how grievous your sin, you may be sitting in this auditorium this evening or watching online and saying, David, you don't know what I've done. You don't know the evil thoughts I think. You don't know the evil attitudes I have. You don't know what's in my past. You don't know how far I've gone from God. But no matter how far you've gone from him, his hand is not short so that it cannot save. He can reach you. No matter how evil your sin, no matter how wicked your deeds, there is no deed that is so wicked that the blood of Jesus cannot make you perfectly clean. The blood of Jesus can set you free. The blood of Jesus can cleanse you. No matter how far you've gone, no matter how long you've been running, the Father sees you. He did all the work. You may be saying tonight, well, I don't know if I could do this because every time I try, I fail. Welcome to the club. But it's not our perfection upon which we rely. It's his. And he made that path clear for you. So that if you put your faith in Jesus, he'll forgive you of your sins. If you turn from your evil ways to him, he'll save you. And he's calling you this evening. This evening, the father 
is running toward you. And all you have to do is accept that embrace by turning from your sin toward him, by repenting of that wrongdoing and falling into the arms of your loving Father. So you're sitting here this evening and you're wondering, what must I do to be saved? How do I, how do I get back to him? Because God feels so distant sometimes. He made a way where there seemed to be no way. And as the Holy Spirit is drawing you, don't resist him. Don't fight. You can make one of two decisions here this evening. First, you can ignore the message, reject Jesus, and you'll leave this auditorium still bound under the weight of sin, still consumed by the shame. And you'll be saying to yourself, I should have turned to Jesus. I should have responded to the gospel. And you'll place your head on your pillow tonight and thoughts be racing through your mind as you say to yourself, what would have happened were I to respond? Or this evening, you can respond to Jesus. You can repent of your sins. You can place your faith in him and the finished work he did on the cross. Trust in him for your salvation. And you'll leave this room. You'll log off from online. And if your bank account is empty, in the morning when you check it, it will probably still be empty. <laughs> and if your marriage is in a rough patch, you're gonna wake up in the morning and you'll very likely still be in that rough patch. The trials that you have aren't going to magically disappear. Yes, I believe in miracles. Please hear me. I believe in miracles. Absolutely. But that's not the promise of the gospel, that everything will be perfect. In fact, things might get worse for you. And you'll know the joy of persecution. And you'll know the joy of being rejected. You'll know the joy of being hated by the world. But I'll tell you what you will have. You'll have Jesus. And as you leave the auditorium, you'll walk out of this room and that burden of sin that was so heavy, you'll find that Jesus has lifted it. And you'll find that the peace in your mind goes beyond explanation. And the, suddenly there will be this joy in your heart and there'll be this peace and there'll be this desire to follow after Jesus. And then you're gonna begin to go the places you used to go and you're not gonna be able to go there anymore because something in you is just gonna be uncomfortable with the way that you, you, you feel there. And you're not going to be able to do the same things you used to do. You'll still have the free will to do them, but something in you is going to say, this doesn't feel right anymore. And people are going to look at you different, and your family may reject you, and your friends may make fun of you, and the world definitely will hate you. But you're going to leave here forgiven of your sins, reconciled unto God, made new. For the scripture says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. You become a new creation. All things pass away. A perfect life? No. But your sins will be forgiven, and you'll be reconnected, and you'll know the embrace of your Heavenly Father. So I ask you tonight to make a choice. Jesus said, if you acknowledge me before man, I'll acknowledge you before my Heavenly Father. 
if you deny me before man, I'll deny you before my heavenly Father. When you follow Jesus, it's a public declaration. Don't be ashamed of him. When you follow Jesus, it's a lifelong commitment to him. Because if he becomes your savior, he also is your Lord. Will you mess up? Yes. But he'll help you get it right. He'll help you to get this right. And so this evening, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. And you know that you have to respond to this message. Maybe you've never received the Lord, or maybe you've fallen away, or you're not exactly right with God like you should be. I want to invite you this evening to come and place your faith in Jesus through public declaration. And so here's what I want you to do. If that's you and you know that you need to respond to Jesus tonight, you need to repent of your sins. You don't know if you were to die today where you would spend eternity. Tonight's the night to know. I want you on the count of three not looking at the person next to you, not wondering who else will stand with you. I want you on the count of three, if you will make that personal public decision to follow Jesus, on the count of three, I'm gonna ask you to stand. And on the count of three, I'm gonna ask you watching live to write, I will follow Jesus in the comment section. That's, that's gonna be your response. One, two, three. Here's what I want you to do if you're standing. I want you to begin to make your way down to this altar and stand and face me. You up there in the balconies, we will give you the time that you need to get down here and we'll give you the time to also go back to your seat. Look at this church. Can we give the Lord a hand of praise? Sing it as they come, Steve. Still coming. May I be like you? You are the daughter. I am the This evening, as you respond to Jesus, look at this. <laughs> as you respond to Jesus, 
I want you to remember that we are not saved through simply repeating a prayer. That's not how this works. There isn't a magic script that I can give you that will give you access to heaven. What you are doing here this evening is choosing to place your faith in Jesus as you are being drawn by the Holy Spirit. What that means is that you are now trusting him with your very soul. Of all who have claimed access to God, of all who have claimed revelation of the Heavenly Father, of all who have claimed that their way is right, you are, you are banking on Jesus. You are, you are giving your soul to him and say, Jesus, I trust you. I believe you are who you said you were. And I believe you did rise from the dead to prove it. And I believe you can save me. And I believe you did take the punishment for my sin. That's what you're doing. You're placing your faith in him. So what I'm going to have you pray here this evening, as well as those of you watching online, is not a magic script. I'm simply inviting you to respond to the gospel. And this now is between you and God. Because if you respond to simply saying a prayer, but then you don't allow Jesus to save you by changing you, it's not true conversion. I'm just telling you the truth. Look, I'd rather offend you with the truth than comfort you with a lie. I want to see you in heaven. So here this evening, you're putting your faith in Jesus. This is not the end. This is the beginning. This is the first step. And he'll take it from there. So here's what I want you to do, you who are standing here before me, as well as if you're able to, you watching online. When my daughter wants me to pick her up, she puts her hands up like this. I want you to lift your hands like this, just as an outward expression of your surrender to God. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to repeat after me. And church, can we pray with them as they pray this prayer? Hands lifted, eyes closed. Dear Jesus, I come to you a sinner asking you to forgive me. Jesus, today, I reject my sin. I reject the world. I reject the devil. And I accept the free gift of salvation. Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you rose again from the dead in bodily form. And I believe you are seated at God's right hand. Jesus, you are the Son of God. And I turn to you today. Be my Lord, my King, my Savior. I declare by faith, today, now, and forevermore, that I am born again in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 As I look across this group of people, I see many faces many generations. This is the harvest. This is the harvest. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. I'm overwhelmed by this. To Jesus belongs the glory. To Jesus belongs the glory. Look at these faces. I see tears. 
I see expressions of relief as the burden of sin is lifted. Jesus, we honor you. Here's what I want you to do. Can all of you up here please turn and face the rest of the people here in this arena? Look at this. Look at this church. Come on, welcome them to the family of God. The harvest is plentiful. I said the harvest is plentiful. Wow. Now as they go back to their seats, I want us to sing that song, I Surrender All. I'm overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed. I don't know if you saw up here, I'm just speechless. Just to see a sea of people giving their lives to Jesus like that. Who said that the Lord has done with this nation? I don't know who said that. I believe what Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. I know that in the last days, the gospel will, 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 will not lose its power. I know that the gospel will never lose its effect. Yes, in the last days, perilous times will come. Yes, in the last days, there will be chaos and wars and rumors of wars and so on and so on and so on. But the blood of Jesus still has power. The blood of Jesus still has power. Romans chapter 10, turn there with me, please. Romans chapter 10, and that message is the very message about faith that we preach. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by declaring your faith that you are saved. Verse 11. As the scriptures tell us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Never. You put your faith in him, he's not going to let you down. That's the promise. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how can anyone go and tell them without being sent? Think about how the systems of the world push their wicked agendas. 
I can't even put on kids programming anymore without some perverse thing coming through the screen. Somebody is funding that. Think of the wickedness in places of government. Somebody is funding that. Think of the wickedness in the movie industry and in the music industry and in all of the systems of the world. Somebody is funding that. And we can look with frustration and say, why is all of this happening? How are they gaining so much influence? This is why we as believers have to stand behind the gospel. We as believers have the responsibility for this generation to spread the gospel with power. It's our responsibility. And so I'm asking you to help back what we're doing. I'm asking you to get behind the truth that we are speaking. We need the truth to go forth. And I'm asking you, my brothers and sisters, to help us. I don't want to get to heaven and find that there was more I could have done. I want to do everything I can here and now to see souls like this come into the kingdom. And so you're looking at this event, you see how great it is, you see the lives being transformed. That's all wonderful. But we need people backing it. We need people standing with us. I mean, how often do we see moves like this here in the United States, Southern California of all places? They said these days were done. I believe the Holy Spirit is just getting started. He's entrusted us with the move of the Holy Spirit. He's entrusted us to reach this generation. He's entrusted us with this beautiful outpouring. We have to seize this moment, church. The harvest is plentiful. Laborers are few. I sent this email out a while ago. Many of you got it. Some of you probably did not. It's just a simple request that I made for this event. And it says this, dear friend, I'm writing to you today because I knew you might want to be involved in this. As we've traveled the world seeing many saved, healed, delivered, and empowered, we've run into a good problem. At many events, even our overflow rooms have overflowed, with many not making it into the building. In response to this unprecedented spiritual hunger, we have acquired larger and larger venues. It's amazing what God is doing. And now the season God showed me when I first began in ministry is upon us. Our first arena event takes place in Anaheim, California. At the time it says in just a matter of weeks, but here we are tonight. This is where I need your help. Due to the size of these events, our event costs have gone up exponentially. Help send our ministry to reap the plentiful harvest of souls. With no pressure, will you prayerfully consider today making a contribution to help us cover the added cost of the events? They're almost three times, no, two times as much as they've been at the conference centers. Thank you for your consideration and thank you for all you do for this ministry. I appreciate you. I do need to make this very clear as we proceed with the offering here. Your giving is not tied to your healing. Your giving is not tied to your deliverance. So if you're sitting in this room and you think that if you sow a big seed that you're more likely to get healed, keep your money. If you're sitting in this room and you're thinking, if I sow a big seed, maybe God will deliver me or save my family or give me a miracle, keep your money. That's not why we give, because Jesus already paid that price, didn't he? Your, your healing is not tied to this at all. This has nothing to do with your healing. This has nothing to do with your deliverance. This is simply me taking the time out to present an opportunity to you to partner with us with no pressure, with no guilt, with no pressure tactics, no gimmicks. So I'm asking you not to sow for your miracle. 
I'm not asking you to sow for your deliverance. I'm not asking you to sow for your family to be saved. I'm not asking you to sow uh, for for a breakthrough in your spirit. No. For your finances, yes, because you reap what you sow. That's biblical. I'm asking you, as my brothers and sisters, to support this because if you don't support the gospel, nobody will. The cost for these events, we want to keep doing them. I mean, look at the harvest we saw here tonight. You can't put a price on that. And so I'm asking you to pour resources into this outpouring. There are all sorts of people represented here this evening. Some are like that widow with your two minds. You're saying, I can't do much, but I'll do what I can. God's going to bless you. Others, you're maybe more well-resourced, and you have the capacity to take percentages off the cost of this event. Great. God's going to bless you. But whatever you do, do it for Jesus. Whatever you do, do it because you love the gospel. Do it because you want to see souls saved. Do it because you want to see more events like this. And this goes for those of you watching online as well. If we didn't live stream this, the event cost would be cut dramatically, but we want it to include you in this giving so that you can give back into what we're doing even through the live stream. So if you're watching online now, it took resources to get this streamed out to you, uh, significant resources. So here's what I'm asking. I'm asking you to hear from the Holy Spirit and give generously as he moves you to give. And don't resist that, because I think sometimes we become a little afraid, right? We think, if I give this, I'll lack over here. But this is what I know about generosity. When you obey the Holy Spirit and you give as the Lord leads you, God always makes sure there's more than enough. So I'm asking you to, with faith, with compassion, sacrifice and give as the Holy Spirit leads you. We don't, we, we want to continue to make these events free to everyone. And so we're stepping out on faith and asking you to partner with us. Will you do that? Yeah. You watching online, will you do that with us? So again, with no pressure, with no guilt, again, this is not tied to your healing or deliverance. This is just for the sake of continuing to do what we do, the work of the ministry. I'm asking you, my brothers and sisters, I need your help. I need your help because if we don't cover the cost for these events, We have to do fewer and fewer of them, and I want to do more. A door is open. The nations are calling. The harvest is ready. Will you you reap the harvest with me? Because when you sow into this ministry, even though you may not go physically with us to these places in spirit, I believe that's part of your account in heaven. So go with us. Send us.